So let's go ahead and get going. So welcome to Generation 180's uh, lunchtime webinar. Uh, we are talking about Arlington's journey to clean energy. I'm your host, Laura Allen. Now, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Generation 180. One second, there we go. Um, so Generation 180 is a national nonprofit that is dedicated to accelerating the cultural transition to clean energy. We work with communities and individuals across the country to support the implementation of clean energy practices. So today we will be discussing Arlington's 2013 implementation of an aggressive community energy plan that has since made regional made it a regional leader in clean energy implementation. So with five years under their belt, the county has designed many programs and seen many successes. Among them is a recent announcement that five more public schools will be receiving solar installations. And Charlottesville's own Sun Tribe uh, has won that contract. So we're very excited for them. So congratulations to Sun Tribe and also congratulations to all of the community members that made that possible by going before the school board and advocating for clean energy because it's people like you that make a big difference. So five schools are gonna get solar panels on them because of community members and the hard work of our civil servants in Arlington. So thank you all for that. Um, now, uh, we plan to watch that project closely and we'll probably be doing a video. Um, so keep an eye on Generation 180's webpage and our communications with you for more information on that. Now, without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce you to our speaker, Chris Summers. Uh, Chris is an energy analyst for the county's Rethink Energy team. He works to make the goals of Arlington's community energy plan a reality by helping residents and businesses to reduce their energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. Previously, Chris created and managed the energy program at Rebuilding Together, a nonprofit that provides free repairs to low-income homeowners. Chris currently lives in DC and enjoys basketball, soccer, and poker in his free time. How are you doing there, Chris? Great. Um, excited to uh, join and uh, talk about Arlington's work. Excellent. So I'm going to go ahead and um, turn this over to you. But first, I'd like to let our viewers know that we will be taking questions at the end. So you can go ahead and type those into the box, the GoToWebinar box on the side of your screen, uh, whenever you think of them. And we'll be reading them at the very end. OK. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and switch this for you. Just one moment. OK, Chris. Great. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, excited to uh, talk today about um, how Arlington's uh, transitioning to clean energy. Um, Laura and I met at a Virginia Solar Congress just a few weeks ago. Um, Arlington is really, uh, you know, a big proponent of going solar, but uh, other technologies as well. So I was happy to help out um, and talk about our work and hopefully um, inspire other projects uh, and, and share some ideas here. So I'll start with a background on, on our energy work and how our team came together and our plan came together. Uh, get into our community energy plan that sets the long-term vision for how the county will use uh, and generate energy out to 2050. And some of our successes in there, but uh, I think you know it's just as important to talk about barriers and challenges to uh, to our implementation, so we can learn from them, and then talk about a few of our sample programs that are helping folks cut their energy bill, go solar, and businesses as well. So I work for Arlington uh, County on our energy team. There's a handful of us that work on energy issues, uh, but I want to get back uh, and start at the beginning which is to give you a little sense of what Arlington, why, why Arlington values uh, this work. So Arlington is the smallest county in the US. It's, it's right next to DC. Uh, and if you look at DC, it's basically a diamond. And the, the piece of the diamond that's in Virginia uh, is Arlington uh, that was uh, separated out of DC. So it's a very small, very dense community. Um, you know, steeped in the DC uh, culture. 
and really values progressive uh, things like smart growth is one thing that Arlington's famous for. When they were building the metro line uh, through Arlington, they were originally talking about going along the highway, and Arlington was like, no, uh, let's make the best use of this and kind of early, trans early pioneer of transit-oriented development and smart growth. So with that history in mind, um, as you know, uh, interest in climate change and fear of climate change uh, arose, a few board members stepped up and really wanted to address this issue and make sure Arlington was being smart and responsible with how we use energy. So our team was launched in 2007. It was an initiative of one of the board chairs. Uh, there's five board members in Arlington and they rotate the chair and the chair gets to pick an initiative that they want to focus on. So it was an early focus. And then there was also a 10% reduction goal of the county's greenhouse gas emissions. That's the county itself, our fleet, uh, our buildings, and so on. Uh, but since then, we've expanded to look towards the community. And in 2012, uh, the community energy plan effort was launched. And there was a stakeholder group uh, of kind of influential folks from a environmental point of view, but also, you know, building developers, professionals, you know, kind of all we wanted to, in industry wanted to hear kind of all voices and really make it a truly community effort, get those folks as buy-in. So it was really their energy plan to help. And it's, that has really helped us as we've shifted to implementation. So ultimately our team's goal, as Laura said, is to help res residents businesses and the government save energy money and reduce their carbon footprint. And you can see our website there. Uh, I believe we'll be sharing this presentation afterwards. So you can look into uh, some more of the work that we're doing. So as I mentioned, the community energy plan effort was launched in 2012. Uh, but stepping back, why is energy planning important? Why is it important to think long term? So we saw three groups of benefits, why do we need to address this problem and think long-term with this? The first is economic competitiveness. Now, energy costs in the U.S. are much higher than they are in other developed countries, so that's really a inefficient use of resources, and it hurts the economy. It takes money out of people and businesses' pockets. Uh, second, obviously, the environmental benefits. Um, I don't, I'm probably preaching the choir in terms of the um, direness of climate change and the the need to do our part as a community that values uh, values that. And then lastly, energy security. So most of us probably don't think about energy day to day uh, unless the lights go out or, um, or you know, uh, you run out of gas in your car or something like that, right? We only think about it when it doesn't work. But um, it's actually, you know, the grid, the electric grid is a, is a large, very vulnerable network of, of wires that is susceptible to storms, it's susceptible to high demand, it's susceptible to climate change. So, you know, if businesses can't operate, if, if your home doesn't have power, the community suffers and people lose money. So to take on this ambitious goal, um, it's gonna take an all of the above approach. So what, what we're looking at here is what we call the wedge graph. So if you start on the left there, Arlington started out in the baseline year at 13.4 uh, metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions per capita. Uh, for context, leading cities like Copenhagen are more like 3.0. So that was set, established as the goal going out to 2050 that the community would reach kind of where the best practice cities at the time were. Um, the, the top line shows what would happen if we really did nothing on this, if just kind of business as usual happened, we would miss our goal by quite a bit. So each of those wedges represents contributions that each uh, area could make to achieving our goal. So the first one is buildings. That's making buildings more energy efficient, making sure we use less. That's always the best first step. Uh, we're talking about the same thing with transportation. Obviously, renewables will play a big part. Uh, at the time, we were looking into district energy as well, which we've kind of since moved beyond, so I don't uh, really want to delve into that. Uh, but, you know, kind of in its place 
we're talking about, you know, the grid needs to get cleaner as well to make up for some of that. And since this is an element of the county's comprehensive plan, we're updating it every five years as is typical. And we're actually in, and we're at the five year mark now. So we're looking at this again, uh, we're seeking community input, but you know, we've learned a lot in those five years. We're gonna redo this and kind of figure out where our goal is again and what's gonna get us there. So since the plan was adopted and even as it was being adopted, our team has been you know, working to achieve this goal of cutting energy use and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And actually since uh, the program was launched in 2007, have saved the county and the community $4.7 million in annual energy savings through our projects and our programs. So uh, to that point of economic competitiveness, uh, we are seeing those savings from our programs. So you can see a few other metrics here. Uh, one very successful program of ours is the Green Building Program, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later, but that has really addressed programs at scale if we're talking 10 million square feet, double the number of solar systems in Arlington, uh, and so on. So it really shows that if you make this a priority at, for a community, and you allocate some resources to it, uh, you really can see results. This isn't, you know, theoretical. So when I was talking um, about our uh, programs, Laura suggested this slide, and I think it is really important to recognize that it's not, it's not going to be easy. It's a slog. There are things that are going to get in your way. So one challenge that we face is that Arlington is located uh, in Virginia, which is what's known as a, a Dillon's Rule state. So there's basically two different ways that states can operate. Dillon's Rule states, local governments need specific authority to do things. It's not by default that they can, it's by default that they can't. So what that means is that we have limited local authority to really require things. We can't make a stricter building code, for example. If there, um, there are different rules on solar that if it were up to us would change, but we don't have the authority to do that. That's all handled at the state level. Another challenge is that like a lot of the states in the Southeast, we face low electricity prices. So in a sense, that's good because obviously you don't want, uh, you don't want to pay a lot for, for your electricity bill, but if it's that kind of subsidized by the fact that it's still dirty power, those clean energy projects, those solar projects, energy efficiency projects are going to be take longer to pay back. And so it's harder to get things to pencil out. Uh, I alluded to some of the state politics. Solar in Virginia, it's really unfortunate. It is, it's not the most solar friendly state. The, uh, the ut electric utility um, has power at the state level and kind of opposes changes um, and kind of they've, they've been changing their mind but things like power purchase agreements that are a great tool I'll talk about later are not allowed in Virginia. And then lastly, the, uh, you know, continuing that momentum beyond, you know, reaching the summit of adopting the community energy plan and putting that all together. At, at communities um, are always going to be, you know, figuring out where are we going to put our resources and it's, and it's always a challenge to continue the momentum of of project successes and uh, and so on. So uh, I wanted to t give a, a sample uh, of a few of our programs. I'll go through this pretty quickly because uh, I know we want to have time for questions. But uh, feel free to we can delve into any of these uh, as folks are interested. So one program of ours that has been tremendously helpful at uh, helping residents go solar is our solar co-ops. So these are basically a group of, of uh, residents get together and they pool their resources to do a bulk purchase of, of their solar systems. So each individual home, you know, would get their system, but through the power of bulk purchasing, they're able to see a discount. So that's one big benefit. Another benefit is it's really an expensive purchase. Costs are coming down, but it's almost you know as much as a car. So folks need to feel comfortable that they're getting a good deal, that they have someone that they can ask questions to. So the 
nonprofit we partner with, Solar United Neighbors, is a great resource for them, is able to walk them through the process. They do roof screenings and so on uh, to make sure folks are, are ready to get to yes on solar. And lastly, it's like a sale. It gives a, a finite deadline that folks have to make a decision by. So with those with those co-ops, we've done them essentially yearly. We've seen about 120 folks go solar, which more than doubled the number of solar systems in Arlington. Another program of ours really focuses more on the efficiency side of things. I don't know if uh, I'm a big fan of this old house. They're actually doing a net zero home where they're taking a old renovated home, uh, an old home, renovating it and adding an addition. And that's really what this program is about. It's about finding, uh, it's a high leverage point when, when homes are being renovated, you know, walls are open, people are, have wallets are open. So it's a good time to um, ensure that folks are, are thinking about energy. And just by applying, you know, smart energy practices, and then if you're able to afford solar as well, a lot of homes can, can really drastically cut their energy bill. So with that program, we see homes using about half as much energy as they did beforehand, even though in most cases they're really increasing their square footage. Another program that, uh, that is kind of hot in the energy world right now is, our, uh, is PACE, our Property Assessed Clean Energy Program. So this has been adopted over the past 10 years in a number of different states, but we're actually the first jurisdiction in Virginia who's implementing it. The benefit of a PACE program is it allows commercial building owners to annualize their costs out over 20 or 25 years, and then combine that with, they're able to put the lien on the property rather than on uh, the, the, the company personally. Uh, so those two are really big barriers to getting projects off the ground. Number one, having that economics pencil out. And number two, uh, property owners are not in the business of, you know, energy. They're bu wanting to buy and sell buildings. So they don't want to encumber themselves with debt on a building that they might sell two or three years down the line. So it allows building owners to think long term spread out the cost long term, and this is really successful at getting them to cut their energy bill, go solar, cut their water bill. And, and like I said, this is a, a program that's really uh, unfolding throughout the country and has really been successful at getting these energy efficiency and renewable projects off the ground. Our green building program works with commercial development as they're being going through the planning process and getting authority from the county to do so. It's an incentive program where those buildings can get a little extra density, a little extra square footage, which obviously makes them more valuable. In exchange, they are built uh, green using the LEED kind of guidelines, as well as looking at their energy usage specifically and, and turning over their energy data, letting us look at their energy data so we can understand are these practices actually working? So we also want to practice what we preach. And uh, what we're looking at is Key Elementary School. It's actually a net zero school here in Arlington. So we want to practice what we preach by cutting our energy usage and adopting solar for our school buildings and for our county buildings. And as was mentioned before, more school schools will be going solar through uh, a power purchase agreement. So uh, we're going to continue to see more and more Arlington solar systems going in, which, I, which is obviously fantastic. So a power purchase agreement is, is kind of similar to PACE in that it takes the cost of going solar and it spreads it out over an annual payment. So an investor comes in and basically fronts the upfront cost, and then the building owner um, pays back that through their energy savings through the solar. So I, th this is a really a terrific tool for helping well, anyone, but specifically schools, because I know you all are focused on that, go solar 
uh, because generally you're not going to have a lot of upfront money sitting around. So the no upfront cost is a really powerful way to get uh, folks to go solar. And then a new tool that we're seeing that's uh, really exciting for a community like ours where we don't have big open fields, we're basically restricted to only the solar that we can put on our rooftops until this new tool has kind of come around, which is known as a virtual power pur purchase agreement, where instead of the solar going directly on your roof, you sign a contract that enables solar to go in somewhere else on the grid and then you reap the benefits of that solar. So that's an, that allows our, our solar capacity kind of uh, sky's the limit there. So uh, looking forward to using that um, in the, Arlington's looking forward to using that in the future. So that's, that's all I had. Uh, I understand we're turning to questions now, but uh, if you think of something afterwards, feel free to email me or check out our website uh, for more details. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you, Chris. And I'll go ahead and take the screen back here. There we go. All right, so um, please feel free to type your questions down in the box in the corner of your screen, um, and I will read them out for you. That will help us to avoid some of the feedback issues, and folks who are not in silent places can submit their questions. Um, now we had a question sent, uh, Paula from the Climate Reality Project in Northern Virginia would like to know whether Arlington's transition to clean energy played a role in Amazon's selection of Crystal City for the location of their new headquarters. Chris, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, so we've obviously been following that news closely and it's a, a big win for Arlington's local economy. So the way that this worked is that Amazon asked communities to submit kind of a plan for how they would incorporate Amazon into their community. So Arlington was one of those communities, and we uh, we certainly mentioned our sustainability work, and and that was listed as one of the reasons that Amazon selected Arlington. But what does that mean? So one thing is that it's uh, a dense local, you know, local community that's right next to District of Columbia, D.C. So their employees have access to all those amenities. That's smart growth paying off. And then also they have access to transit too. They're right near the airport. So that's sustainable transportation and planning and valuing sustainability as a community really uh, resonated, my understanding is, with, with Amazon. Uh, so I think it, it played a big part in it. That's wonderful. And um, do you think that it will impact the county's plans, the clean energy plan? Well, for sure. Uh, I think the biggest way it'll impact the county is just a, a injection into the local economy. Uh, obviously, that, that that number of high-paying jobs and all the economic activity, uh, I think it'll be great for, for the local economy. And then uh, we'll anticipate more growth from that, but that's where you know the smart growth comes in, that if you're planning as a community to absorb redevelopment, new residents coming in, then you can really realize the benefits and not, you know, if it was a car only community, for example, then you'd be stuck with traffic, gridlock, whatever. But because this is a community that has a good transit system and is well planned, then it's, you know, hopefully going to be all positive. That's wonderful. I'm showing my screen here. Um, so we also have a question about from Jason Halbert. He'd like to know, is your virtual PPA simply a purchase of SRECs or an actual electricity contract? And if you could unpack that for our viewers a little bit, that'd be helpful. Right. So the reason this is a new development is that it's a really a complex transaction. But so when we talk about solar, when you don't specifically have solar on your building, the concept or the term that I've heard is additionality. Basically, if you're buying an SREC, if you're buying carbon offsets, what assurance do you have that you're actually creating new 
solar somewhere, right? So as far as uh, going solar goes, as far as I'm concerned, this is the next best thing to having solar on your roof. And the reason is that the community or the university or whatever, whomever enters this agreement is signing a contract that enables the financiers to actually finance the solar project. So you can say that you for sure, you, those are the panels that we um, put in. And then you do get the, uh, the environmental credits for, for doing that as well. But, but I think in my opinion, it's better again, because you can point to this is the system that we created with this contract. That's helpful, thank you. And we have a question from Ginny Moody, who's here in Charlottesville. She'd like to know, on CPACE, you mentioned split incentives and said the program allows pass-through of cost to tenants. Can you explain that? Right, um, so the concept of split incentives is that, you know, you have a, let's say you have a rental building, a multifamily building. Um, if the building owner wants to invest in the building, they're not necessarily going to see all of the economic benefit of that because uh, the tenants may be the ones paying for the electricity bill. So the tenant's electricity bill goes down, the building owner doesn't benefit from that. Uh, so the, the PACE program, uh, the pass-through aspect of that is if you, uh, a number of, basically those, those savings can be passed on uh, to true up that split incentive. Jenny, I hope that answers your question. Please let us know if you need any further clarification on a specific element of that. We can also discuss that more offline. Um, and we have a question here from Emily Little, who's also here in Charlottesville. Emily asks, we in Charlottesville are looking to ask the city to set goals to decrease carbon. What are some of the things you would lead with in your ask of local government? Basically, what did you use as your major selling points? Right. Um, so I think that slide where, uh, well, it's no, no sense in bringing it back up, but basically the economic benefit, I think, is what's going to resonate the most with people with because it, it really will resonate with any audience, whether they're a climate skeptic, a fan of solar, anti-solar, whatever. Uh, so whether you're talking about putting a solar system on a school, whether you're talking about investing in an energy efficiency project, I think, you know, there's numerous examples of, of folks that have done that and they've seen the savings that you can point to. And then I think to the extent that uh, your community values, you know, fighting climate change, that's, that may be something you want to loop in or, you know, that can be tricky because it gets, it, you know, maybe polarizes folks. It gets some people very motivated. It, get, it may turn others off to your message. But you can still speak to other environmental benefits. I, uh, I was in a discussion with a uh, living in DC here with a Republican lobbyist and he was saying basically everyone is gonna agree that clean air and clean water are worthwhile. So pointing to the other environmental benefits, your community health and so on, I think that would resonate too. And then another lesson that we really learned with, and I alluded to this earlier, is that it, it's great to have a plan. It's great to think long term. That's that's very important. I think the real challenge is continuing to push and continuing to have the motivation and focus on it. So uh, so bringing a group of stakeholders, people who are invested in it, whether it's politicians, whether it's local business, whether it's getting a group of uh, students together, a group of environmentalists together. Uh, and, and, you know, making sure that people keep hearing that this needs to be a priority of the community. This is a thing that we value and making sure that, uh, that, that the community doesn't lose focus on continuing to do this good work. Certainly, it's always challenging to keep the energy up. Uh, so I understand that you all are at the five-year review period for your community energy plan. Looking back, what are your top lessons learned and uh, what would you change going forward or for, for a city that's doing the same thing from the beginning? Right. Uh, well, we've, 
uh, we've seen basically that um, showing results is important. Uh, we, for a while, we were um, invested. I, I mentioned earlier district energy that we we're kind of not doing that anymore. So district energy is a concept where you basically build a local energy network uh, for a, a series of buildings and that by attacking it with economies of scale, you're able to bring energy costs down. Now, theoretically, that's a great idea, but it's a very long-term thing that would, that would take you know, de a decade plus to happen. So showing short-term results, I think is important to continue to, to demonstrate that the, uh, the programs are, are saving real people real money. Um, I think the messaging is something that we've improved over time that, like I said, the economic message resonates with everyone, whereas the environmental message resonates with some people and maybe uh, turns some people off. Um, and, and I think, like I said, the having the group of, of stakeholders and influencers and making it their plan, that's something that's really helped us out to continue our uh, momentum. Can you go into a little more detail on uh, how you help people to feel ownership of this plan? Right. Uh, so, it, you know, it's called the Community Energy Plan, and it was truly approached that way. It, you could have had, you know, a few staff, some consultants come in, basically draw up a plan that's technically sound, uh, call it a goal and call it a day. We basically did the opposite of that. Uh, this was a two-year process where a group of 30 to 40 uh, folks at the uh, advisory group that I mentioned, they're in industry, they're in the local government, they're, in, they're developers, and we brought them together around a table and said, you know, this is a, this is a focus, this is something we think is important uh, based on your work, you think this is important, uh, tell us what you want it to be. Tell us how ambitious we should be. And actually, uh, folks in that group had a, so they met periodically and they had different decision points. One was how ambitious, how low do we want our goal to be? And they actually had a choice of, you know, kind of the middle path of maybe it was 4.5 versus the more aggressive path 3.0. And they actually went for the more aggressive one. So, you know, by kind of, um, they had the choices, they felt the ownership, they thought it was valuable uh, so that it would be, it would really be a community plan and not just, um, you know, a, doc, a bureaucratic document that's, you know, posted on a website somewhere and, and no one knows about. Certainly. So now that you're revisiting the plan, do you think they'll make it more aggressive now that the IPCC report is out? Yeah, that's uh, we've we've certainly heard that feedback from some groups that that you know 3.0 is great. We see a lot of communities that have more ambitious targets than that now. Now it remains to be seen whether they'll do it, but you know you have to admire the ambition. I think another benefit of going to say uh, so the Sierra Club has a Ready for 100 campaign that is challenging communities to to go to 100% renewable electricity. I think there's a simplicity to that message, right? You don't have to explain what a metric ton is. You don't have to say, well, 3.0 is Copenhagen. Everyone can appreciate what 100% renewable or zero carbon means. So I think from a messaging point of view, there's there's a benefit. Um, so at the same time, though, I, I think we have to be realistic what, what we can accomplish as a local government. So I think that would be the pushback. So we'll see. We'll see where it ultimately lands and what we think is feasible, but, uh, you know, properly ambitious. Well, it's always good to be ambitious. Um, here in Charlottesville, we're having that same debate of how ambitious is the right amount, and um, with climate change becoming something that is part of our everyday lives more and more, um, there's more public motivation, it seems, to really set big goals. Um, I like Sierra Club, you know, Sierra Club is a good partner of ours and their Ready for 100 campaign 
it definitely has a lot that we can all learn from, so that's excellent. Uh, we have another question here from Jim Dye. He wants to know whether Arlington provides an education curriculum for school districts when they convert to solar. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so our schools, uh, so the key elementary school and, and the few others that have solar installations, they've definitely incorporated the learning component with with the school, but specifically the key elementary school because it was designed from the building as this from the beginning that this is this is what we're going for. We're going for net zero. There's so many different educational parts of it, and it and it's such a great opportunity. Uh, I remember growing up, you know, I. I'm an engineer, I was drawn to energy, but this was just not something I was aware of. It's it's something I came to a little bit later in college that hey, this is important and and it's a a exciting field where where new technologies are developing and so on. So I can imagine all the creative sparks that that's creating. And then I believe our curriculum there is different sustainability elements within it. So there's actually, so this is kind of counterintuitive. The county government and county schools are actually two different entities, um, one focusing obviously on the schooling, and then we kind of do all the rest, police, human services, all that kind of stuff. So uh, we aren't personally involved in the curriculum, but, uh, but I know our colleagues over there are doing a great job uh, teaching folks the value of, of all this great work. That's excellent. And that's something that we all need to keep in mind. The school board is very often a separate entity from the county or the city, and they work from different budgets and have different legislative bodies. So you have the school board members, and then you have the city council members, and they have to be addressed separately. And often the political dynamics for them are quite different. Um, so that is an important thing to differentiate. I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, but yeah, also, and, and, we, mm -hmm. yeah. Just to build on build on what you were saying, another important part of this is simply just knowing the mechanisms of how government works, right? It, you know, who basically who is your representative? Uh, when are the meetings? All that. It's a uh, working for local government for almost seven years now. It's really been. It's like any other organization, right? You just have to know how it works, who to talk to what the decision points are and so on. And that's that's really an important part of of making solar happen, making energy efficiency projects happen, is just, you know, how does the actual thing work? That's so true. And what we found over and over is that often it's about finding one champion on that board uh, who's willing to bring your issue to the forefront and to speak for you in those meetings. There are opportunities for the public to speak, but when a person who's actually a board member speaks for the issue, it lends it a lot of credibility, and you're much more likely to get other council members on your side and willing to vote for the same issue. So making those connections offline that, you know, where it's outside of the big board meeting with, you know, possibly cameras and an audience, um, you know, where you can have real conversations and learn the social and cultural priorities of your board members makes a huge difference in the success of, of getting your issue out in, into the public dialogue and uh, having your resolution voted on. Uh, so that's really a, a very good point. Thank you. Um, I had one other question about that wedge graph. I do really love that. Um, let's see if I can, I think I'd have to pass it back to you to put that slide back up, but I'm wondering, um, so in that graph, you break down um, which areas will have the greatest uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Um, and I know buildings were a large portion of that graph and um, different, uh, you know, transportation, that sort of thing. I'm wondering if there was a sector uh, or a business group that adopted those changes more readily, or if there was an area that uh, has been slow to change that where you could give us some advice. Right. Um, well, the so transportation is something that's more centrally planned. So I think there's a benefit, there's an ease with that of that. You know, there's a transportation department in Arlington that figures out uh, where budgets go between you know roads and 
and transit and so on. Uh, although the it's also probably the most volatile sector with all the car sharing services that are new now that are um, another option compared to transit. On the plus side, electric vehicles, here we go. Um, there's the wedge graph. Uh, so, so I think that's kind of, if you're, that's like the highest variance one in terms of could get the cleanest, could get the least clean would be transportation. Buildings and energy efficiency is kind of a slow and steady pace that you see the, the building code updates roughly every three years and it gets a little uh, cleaner, a little greener every time, hopefully, uh, certainly in the long run it does. So over time, buildings are going to be built more efficiently and uh, and energy efficiency projects kind of methodologically are going to come out through um, just over time, building owners are investing in their buildings and making them cleaner and greener. Uh, but that's, you know, not a, a sector that you're going to see a, a big jump shift. You, just because you have this existing building stock, it doesn't turn over nearly as quickly as, say, cars do. Uh, so that's kind of a titanic, slow-moving ship. And I guess renewables is probably the one that, that we're going to see the biggest uptick. I would, you know, if you're, again, you know, variance and kind of, and trajectory, I think I would say for sure that's something that we're seeing a big uptick in now. And just as prices continue to come down, as different financing methods continue to be available, power purchase agreements hopefully become more and more available throughout the country. Uh, I think there's no question that solar is going to play a, a huge part in, in transforming the uh, energy sector. Certainly, and it's interesting to me what you mentioned about uh, the building code being a part of that transformation and having what's you know part of the building code uh, every three years is actually pretty frequent in the world of buildings um, and solar installs. You know, the it often takes two years to get a solar install from you know just hearing about it to signing a contract for installation. So um, for building codes to become more clean energy oriented and energy efficiency oriented would be an interesting area to focus some attention. Um, oh, we have some questions here. So I have a question from Marina Janis. She would like to know, how was the development of the, fu of the plan funded? If it was publicly funded, how were politicians convinced to appropriate the money? Right. Well, this is back to the the notion that having a a political um, a, a politician as your friend is 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 so valuable. So the way that uh, our government uh, it's uh, I believe the model is called a county manager government. Basically, the the county manager is a staff person who everyone, including myself, reports to. They come up with a budget, but then the board is actually going to be the ones that adopt it. So they really get a lot of say over the budget. So if if a board member, if the mayor, if a council member has it as a priority, they're able to um, they're able to carve out that money. So like I mentioned, two different board chairs actually made this a priority, Paul Ferguson and Jay Fassett. They made it their priority as the board chair for that year and they were able to carve out some funds to to do the planning and and actually adoption with uh with the implementation part uh we're funded through what's known as a residential utility tax which is a, a local usage tax based on energy usage so that's a, a budget that's carved out for for implementation so if you can have a dedicated stream like that that's you know kind of a long-term piece of infrastructure, so to speak, that that will continue to yield results. Um, so we're fortunate to have that. And is that tax provided through Dominion? You know, I'm not 100% sure the of how the mechanics of that work. I, you know, broadly speaking, most states tend to uh, to carve out some funds from uh, from usage from energy usage and allocate that towards clean uh, clean energy programming. Virginia, 
less so. So I think that part of that is the locality was able to argue, well, we're not doing this on a state level, so therefore it's appropriate to do it on a local level. Certainly. Well, I'm glad that you're, get, you're finding the funding and that uh, the folks that took this on as their pet projects did so because it looks like you're doing some amazing work here. Um, we have a shout out from, oh, excuse me, hold on. Uh, April Keating has a question. She says, many states are not solar friendly and make laws against people going off grid. Will new laws come down from the state or feds putting charges on folks for going solar rather on or, or off grid? Right, I mean, it's definitely a, an ongoing um, discussion, battle, however you want to put it. I can speak to Virginia that, you know, we're starting from a very unfriendly, a very solar unfriendly state, but that it's moving in the right direction. That, so for example, power purchase agreements are not allowed for private sector or residents in Virginia, but they used to not be allowed at all. And then about five years back, they became um, a, a tool available to nonprofits and local government. So that's a step in the right direction. There's also gonna be a community energy uh, tariff, uh, sorry, not a community energy tariff, a solar tariff that will be available to residents in the coming years. So there is progress. Uh, I'm definitely not talking about our friendly utility, but you will see utilities that will push back on things like net metering fees, that which is the fee that you pay to connect to the grid when you have a solar system. Typically, you would not operate off grid, although more power to you if you do, but typically people with solar systems still tap into the grid. And then when they need power, they buy. And when they have where they're generating excess, they sell, and that's called a net metering arrangement. So there's a fee that the utility um, is able to argue that they deserve for that. So that's a, an, another kind of leverage point that we're seeing some utilities push back there. But um, again, this is the the value of people caring about it and speaking out on it that, you know, it's going to be an ongoing discussion, and hopefully it goes in the right direction. Certainly, and we're already on going in the right direction now. So um, once again, thanks for all your hard work. And as I was gonna say earlier, we have a comment from Mark Heininger of Green Schools National Network, who is working with Discovery Elementary School, which is the largest net zero elementary school. Um, and that's in Arlington. Uh, so we love to feature Discovery Elementary because they are such an impressive school and if you live in the area they do do tours that are pretty cool and um, they do inc incorporate the solar panels into their curriculum which is also impressive. So um, with that I think we'll be wrapping up. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to put my information back up here. Um, so you can email me if you have any questions about uh, the presentation or Generation 180's work or you would like Generation 180 to support your community in your process for um, going clean, clean energy. So um, solar schools is one of our major projects and we're always eager to hear about people who are working on this in their own communities and taking steps to move forward. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. Chris, thank you so much for making time to prepare this presentation for us and uh, answer all of these really insightful questions. Um, we are grateful to everyone for joining us. All right, you all have a great week.